You should be seeing a map. Yes, we can see it. Okay, good. Effectivement. Good. Okay, this um, is the Democratic Republic of Congo as it appears on maps of Africa today, uh, in the heart of Africa. Here is how it appeared to Europeans uh, a little over two centuries ago, a complete blank space. Of course, it wasn't a blank space. Uh, tens of millions of people lived there, probably about 20 million people in the area that today is the DRC. But to Europeans, it appeared blank because they couldn't get there. The main reason they couldn't get there was that the Congo River, as it flowed down to the Atlantic, went over some of the world's largest rapids, and this meant they couldn't uh, sail their ships up the river and explore uh, the center of the continent. This so-called blank space on the map caught the eye of King Leopold II of Belgium, who took the throne of Belgium in 1865 at the age of 30. And he was a man who was extremely ambitious. I think he was frustrated with being a king in an era when monarchs had to share power with elected parliaments. And his ambition was to find himself a colony, a part of the world where he could reign supreme and could make himself a lot of money. He hired the British explorer, Henry Morton Stanley, to stake out for him this territory in the center of the continent. Stanley managed to get around those rapids of the river by building a road <coughs> and was able to put steamboats on the Great River. The Congo River and its tributaries form a network of, international, of interconnected waterways more than 10,000 kilometers long. And for a conqueror, a colonist looking for a colony, this was like conquering a territory that had, in, that had a built-in railway system. This was what opened up this territory to the exploitation of its natural resources by outside forces and the extraction of those riches, which I think has been the hallmark of its history ever since then. What were the Europeans looking for? First of all, it was ivory. Ivory was something immensely valued in the late 19th century because it could be made into jewelry, buttons, carvings, statuettes. One very common use was piano keys. In several factories in Connecticut, ivory from the Congo was made into the surfaces of the piano keys for almost all the pianos sold in the United States. All of this ivory was gathered and all of the colonial economy in Africa in the late 19th and early 20th centuries was done by forced labor. Labor done by the Congolese inhabitants under the supervision of European foremen and supervisors. These forced laborers were often transported from one place to another in chains. Any kind of dissidence or rebellion against the system was punished harshly uh, with the notorious whip, the chicot, made out of sun-dried hippopotamus hide uh, with sharp edges. The Europeans who enforced this system were heavily armed. This is an advertisement from a gun shop in Antwerp, the departure port for Belgians going to the Congo. The European thirst for Congo's riches increased dramatically because of something that was invented in 1887, the inflatable bicycle tire. That was followed very soon by the invention of the automobile. And there was also a growing demand for rubber in industry, for rubber to coat telephone and telegraph wires, and for many other industrial uses. This produced a huge worldwide rubber boom that lasted for several decades. In the equatorial African rainforest, rubber grew wild as vine. And so Leopold's colonial regime mobilized by force Africans to tap that rubber 
and extracted from the vines, hundreds of thousands of them. The male population of much of the rainforest area was turned into forced laborers to gather rubber in baskets like these. Often it required them days and sometimes weeks out of each month to go far into the rainforest to gather a required quota, monthly quota of wild rubber. How were they made to scatter widely into the rainforest to gather this rubber? Very simple, their wives were held hostage. This system produced an enormous death toll. Many of the hostages starved to death. Many of those male rubber workers were worked to death. Uh, with people being forced laborers or hostages, the production of food by farming, hunting, fishing decreased dra dramatically. There were famines and near famines. People were also killed in rebellions against this regime or died deep in the forest trying to escape the forced labor system. The best estimate is that over a 40 year period, 1880 to 1920, the Congo lost about 10 million people. Its population shrank by that many. There was a worldwide protest movement against the atrocities of this system. Once people started seeing photographs like the one that we just uh, looked at, and Leopold, the owner of this territory as his private colony, was vilified all over the world uh, in cartoons like this and in other ways. Uh, in a way, he was easy to pick on because here was this one man who owned this enormous territory as his personal colony. The people who took part in these protests often ignored the fact that Fa that forced labor was the foundation of the colonial economy throughout most of Africa. For example, German, French, and Portuguese colonies that had wild rubber, looked. the colonial officials there looked at how much money Leopold was making from this forced labor system, and they copied it exactly. But Rather than looking at them, it was easier for people to just, the protesters to just focus on Leopold and think that all this, these problems came from one uh, greedy king. Uh, before his death in 1909, Leopold made uh, more than 1 billion in today's American dollars, the equivalent of today's American dollars, from this forced labor system, gathering ivory and principally wild rubber. Uh, it went into projects like uh, additions to the Royal Palace at Lachen outside Brussels, uh, which where he built one of the world's largest collections of privately owned greenhouses. Uh, he spent much of it on monuments, of grandiose monuments of various sorts, like the Arcade du Saint-Cotonneur in Brussels, one of the city's iconic landmarks. And People who worked with him uh, made money and uh, built their own extravagant things as well. This is a chateau in Belgium built with Congo profits by a close associate of Leopold who built the first railway line in the Congo. In the last few years, uh, Leopold has come in for a good deal of criticism. Statues of him have been defaced and some have been torn down. Uh, after his death, uh, new resources were discovered in the Congo. Uh, copper replaced rubber as the main source of wealth extracted from the ter territory, although there were many other sources as well, uranium, diamonds, and more. Copper was the biggest throughout most of the first half of the 20th century. Uh, this photograph was taken in 1925. It uh, was a club for the European employees of the Union Minière de Haute Katanga, the principal Belgian mining company. Uh, the Europeans who worked there were executives, supervisors, engineers, skilled workers. The hard labor was done by Africans. Here's a photograph of African laborers taken at exactly the same time. They were recruited by a labor contractor for the same mining company routinely photographed uh, almost like slaves when they were brought to the mines like this. Skipping ahead, finally in 1960, under considerable pressure, Belgium granted independence to the Congo. King Baudouin of Belgium came there to 
do this formally in a ceremony uh, in the <clears throat> June of 1960. Uh, the hope was that European and American companies could continue to profit from the territory, even if it was under uh, the political rule of the Congolese. This is what the Belgians were hoping for. However, these plans were threatened when the first democratically chosen prime minister in the Congo turned out to be Patrice Lumumba. He believed that Africa should be economically as well as politically independent of Europe. This set off alarm bells in Brussels and in Washington where the governments did not want to tolerate this. And as I'm sure most all of you know, Lumumba was far too radical for the Belgian and Americans. They worked with his opponents in the Congo. He was swiftly deposed after only a few months in power, arrested and assassinated in early 1961. Soon after that began the 32 year dictatorship of Mobutu Sese Seko, supported at every step of the way by the United States. He received more than a billion dollars worth of U.S. aid, military uh, and civilian. During his reign in power, President George H.W. Bush, who you see here, called him one of our most valued friends. Boot, like Leopold, uh, made a huge personal fortune uh, off the territory. He had a more developed economy to steal from. It's estimated that he and his entourage pocketed somewhere around the equivalent of $4 billion during his time in power. He built grand palaces in various places, uh, including this one <coughs> near his native village in the north, which actually had an airstrip big enough for the supersonic Concorde to land, he used to charter this plane when he wanted to make trips to Europe. He was overthrown in 1997, succeeded by Laurent Kabila, who was assassinated soon after that, and in turn succeeded by his son, Joseph Kabila, who was president for many years and amassed his own considerable fortune, although not as big as Mobutu's or Leopold's. <laughs> Kabila is no longer president today, but still wields great power behind the scenes and also had a fondness for grand palaces. This is the presidential palace in Kinshasa. Today, there's a greatly expanded list of natural resources that are extracted from the country. Gold, coltan, cobalt, all these things are in the cell phones that uh, most of us use every day. Tin, diamonds, tungsten, timber, and much more. And almost all this wealth flows out of the country and the profits benefit people elsewhere. The average household income in the country is less than the equivalent of three American dollars per day. And as you all know, I'm sure the country's also been badly ravaged by civil war over the last 20 years or so, especially in the mineral rich East and Northeast as surrounding African countries and the lo various local warlords they support fight over these natural resources. It's hard for me to think of another place on earth that is so richly endowed with natural resources, but where so little of these riches are enjoyed by the people living there. That has been the pattern for nearly a century and a half and I think changing that is the major task facing the country today. So I am going to stop there and turn it back to you, Kumba. And I need to figure out how to unshare my screen here. Oh, I see. Here we are. Stop share. Good. Thank you so much, Adam, for this presentation. Uh, it's... Uh, it's humbling, um, um, you know, we, we, we know many of these things, but to see it, you know, back to back this way, um, bring us back to, to what you just said at the end. Uh, we know very little place on earth, so rich and with so much resources and people really benefiting so little from it. 
I'm going to turn to the panelists. Uh, you all heard um, the, the context that Adam just helped us set from, from his work and research. And um, I want to ask you also to give us, you know, just small pieces, not as long. I just want to hear also from you because from the work that you are doing, uh, to be able to change things and fight and uh, move things, you, you have to, to, to learn also something about what's going on, what has been going on historically, but what's also going on today. Uh, maybe you can give us, each of you, just one fact also, one or two facts that, are, that touch you about what's happening to the people of the Congo uh, from the past to, to today. Uh, I'll, I'll start with um, Esmeralda. Hi, everybody. Thank you, Kumba. Thank you, Adam, for a, a brilliant presentation. So tragic, because as you said, this country is so rich, and it's like it's being doomed because it's so rich, and it's always the foreigners who can really uh, uh, have all the riches of Congo. So I think we, we have seen that from the beginning, from the colonial start, it has been a corporate state. And the, the aim was really to extract resources and exploiting people. Uh, it reminds me of a, a writer who said, Paul Karzak, who said, it was a mutilation of the bodies, the land and the culture because we have seen all the abominable crimes and the, the rape, the, the massacres, the torture, but we cannot forget also the social and cultural impact of colonialism. The fact that people were told that they had to follow one faith, which was not theirs, to abandon their language for another one, to, to be displaced because people needed their land, and all that because they had to be civilized by the Western world. And so this is a terrible impact too, which we can see it still remains today because today, of course, the colonizers are not there, but the multinationals are there. And the way they exploit the land and the people is about the same. It's really the colonial legacy and it's, over and over again, the fact that the resources are being taken for another country, for the pleasure of other people, and it's always expanding, always uh, destructive. And it's like a vicious cycle that we have to absolutely uh, stop. Thank you, um, Esmeralda. I'll, I'll come back to you, um, Michael. Uh, you, you've heard also um, the presentation, just your, your first reaction, but also maybe something you might want to add um, to, to that. Um, Esmeralda is talking about the cultural, the invisible sometimes part of this, this uh, uh, I want to call it genocide. <laughs> um, yeah. <clears throat> yes. <laughs> thank you, Kumba. Uh, and yes, thank you, Esmeralda and uh, Adam for your presentation. I'm very happy to be on this call. So, Yes, I think what uh, Esmeralda uh, touches on is that colonialism had very many dimensions. And what we today might want to call neo-colonialism also has many dimensions, including cultural, social, economic, political dimensions, other dimensions also. Um, and that in order to um, complete the process of decolonization, if you will, which is largely, maybe mostly um, uncompleted. Then there are many different dimensions of decolonization that needs to be addressed, um, you know, including in education, including uh, domestically, uh, but also in Congo's relationship to the global economy that uh, as uh, both uh, Adam and, and Esmeralda uh, mentioned and makes very clear that they are, uh, you know, very clear continuations between the resource and human exploitation of um, King Leopold, for instance, and today's exploitation 
of um, you know cobalt and uh, many other uh, minerals and today um, you know and this is something that is also well documented for instance by by the UN there was a recent report that just came out a couple of weeks ago by the way on illicit financial flows from 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 Africa uh, by UNCTA, the UN Conference on Trade and Development. And, you know, it showed that not only do uh, transnational companies in Congo, um, you know, exploit, ruthlessly uh, exploit uh, the Congolese people and its natural resources, but there's also a lot of tax evasion and these sorts of uh, things. So, uh, not even uh, when it comes to the taxes of, of the uh, resources that are being extracted, do they even, not even taxes, uh, go back to the Congolese uh, people. So um, the self-determination de and sovereignty of, of natural resources and the Congolese economy, that will also be, that is a, also a critical part of the um, decolonization that is yet to happen. Thank you so much, Michael. Michael is from the European Network of People of African Descent. He's a researcher, an advocate for human rights. I see already in the chat, people are asking, please provide the link of the report that they want to see read it. Um, and um, Esmeralda de Belgique that spoke just before is also a journalist, an activist, a writer, a documentary maker. And you know, uh, we will we will come back to her soon. But um, now I want to give the, the floor to, to Patricia, uh, Patricia of of, of Congo Love, of Friends of Congo, Patricia of Africans Rising for Peace, Justice, and Dignity. Um, she lives and breathes for Congo, uh, and she's just a fierce, fierce uh, sister and, and 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 fighter for for justice at every level. Um, so Patricia, just also, uh, what do you have to, to add to this? Because you know, as, as we, we work to make change, we also need to face what we want to change. Um, thank you so much for this opportunity to be on this platform. I first wanna just say Mbote na bande konanganyo so obaza na Congo, toza ensemble. I think it's very heartbreaking to see from a human perspective, what we're capable of when we're not held accountable. Uh, to see what is happening in the Congo is a reflection of what's going on in Africa and the global community, uh, where Blacks live all around the world, starting from Africa to the USA, and we, we see that today. I think it's very important for us to take into perspective what our perpetrators have done, and to also learn this history so that history doesn't repeat itself, but more importantly, to understand that Africa did not start with colonialism, that we do have a history prior to this colonialism. And it's very important for us to understand that history so that we are empowered, energized, and have bold visions with powerful dreams and unshakable convictions. And the youth of today, I do believe, understand this and due to technology, and I always, I was talking earlier as I was preparing, the, the irony that the coal tan and the cobalt that comes out of the Congo, the world is able to watch today, but over 80 million people in the Congo, 90% of them are not even able to participate in this conversation to know their history. So I'm looking forward to this conversation and thank you so much, Adam, and everybody who's on this panel. Um, I don't wanna say too much because I know we have a, a long journey ahead, but uh, uh, I, I just want us to just remember that our history goes beyond these 500 years. I think you're on mute. Sorry, I say thank you so much for reminding us of that uh, history. Uh, I just want to let the floor for Jean-Marie also very quickly uh, to talk also about what, what's happening. The crimes are still going on. Um, Jean-Marie himself have been you know, arrested uh, not arrested, I want to say abducted and, uh, you know, taken, tortured. Both him and his um, lawyer have been, you know, in, in, in jail. So Jean-Marie, uh, just a few words to, to start with. He's um, the activist of the year for Africans rising in 2019. He's the uh, founder of La Quatrième Voix. Uh, 
uh, the, the director, um, the, the director today, uh, please, uh, if you can, um, you will have to, to listen into, uh, switch to um, listening to interpretation in English as Jean-Marie uh, will be speaking in French. <laughs> Oh, oui, euh, j'ai vraiment euh, très bien suivi euh, euh, le conférencier euh, Adam. Euh, il n'a fait que rappeler euh, l'histoire euh, de notre pays et une histoire euh, à chaque fois lorsqu'on nous la rappelle, euh, ça fait toujours euh, très mal. Euh, mais je dirais que euh, rien n'a changé. Il a parlé des 10 millions de morts à l'époque euh, du roi Léopold II. Et aujourd'hui, nous comptons euh, plus euh, de 6 millions de morts et les gens continuent toujours euh, à mourir. Vous venez de l'évoquer, euh, que j'ai été euh, arrêté. Donc, c'est à plusieurs reprises et torturé. Et nous vivons toujours la même situation. Donc, euh, après la colonisation, il y a eu euh, les néocolonialismes. Donc, euh, nous sommes en train de nous battre euh, contre euh, les néocolonialismes dans toutes euh, ses formes. Et euh, la jeunesse congolaise a actuellement une grande responsabilité, non seulement pour le Congo, mais c'est pour toute l'Afrique. Alors, euh, c'est vraiment euh, important que nous puissions euh, nous battre euh, sérieusement pour que nous changions notre continent. Mais le combat euh, du Congo... Euh, ne sera pas vaincu simplement par les Congolais. C'est le combat de toute l'Afrique. Euh, tous les Africains doivent euh, les mettre dans leur tête. Et quand nous essayons de voir euh, Kwame Kouma, Sekou Touré, Franz Fanon, ainsi de suite, euh, le Congo est au centre euh, du développement, du décollage du continent africain. Et euh, nous, jeunes Congolais, nous portons cette responsabilité-là. Nous, jeunes Africains, nous faisons la même chose également. Et c'est vraiment triste, je voudrais souligner simplement que rien n'a changé en réalité. Donc, euh, le Congo est toujours pillé, exploité par l'extérieur. Et moi, j'aimerais que les gens ne puissent pas rencontrer simplement l'histoire, mais qu'ils puissent nous aider si il nous aime réellement. Quand, quand je dis ça, je parle de la Belgique, ainsi de suite, parce qu'aujourd'hui, la Belgique veut en sorte, euh, en sorte que euh, la relation soit rétablie avec euh, la République démocratique du Congo par rapport à tout ce qui s'est passé. Mais que ce soit quelque chose de sincère, parce qu'on ne le sent pas, même sur le plan diplomatique. La Belgique, comme les États-Unis, la position de la France sur le Congo, sans pour autant tenir des relations, si je peux dire, personnelles qu'elle a eu à voir avec le Congo. Donc, jusque-là, euh, tout ce que fait la Belgique ne constitue qu'un semblant, aussi longtemps que la Belgique ne va pas euh, arranger sa diplomatie. Donc, actuellement, la, la, euh, la Belgique ne doit pas jouer une diplomatie d'intérêt. On sait bien qu'entre les nations, il n'y a que des intérêts. Mais, comme la Belgique veut rétablir, parce que euh, même le, le roi, la lettre du roi qu'il qu venait d'écrire euh, au, au président Tshisekedi, euh, oui, mais euh, qu'est-ce qu'il fait euh, comme geste Oui, geste, c'est la lettre, mais en réalité, que fait la diplomatie euh, du royaume de la Belgique euh, par rapport à la République démocratique du Congo Donc, tout cela, ce sont des points que nous devons uh, bien souligner. Voilà. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jean-Marie. Again, for those of you who do not speak French, there is a button called interpretation under the Zoom. You have to click there and then you will choose a channel. It will say English and you will hear directly what uh, Jean-Marie is saying. I see on the chat people asking. Maybe Maurice can guide uh, some, of, some of you to, to, to get But, um, when, when the next time Jean-Marie speak, you can hear it directly in, in, in English. Thank you so much for this. We, we are coming exactly to that, Jean-Marie, what you're just saying. Uh, from all of this history, uh, and as Adam said it in the beginning, 
yes, this, is, this happened in the Congo, but the truth and the reality is that this is the way it was in many, many other places on the continent. And this was the way uh, many governments, whether it's England or Germany or Italy or France, worked on the continent. It was to force labor. labor. Slavery was one piece, but after slavery, uh, Africans have been enslaved on their own continent during that whole time. And this is something that we need to see uh, uh, to, and to, to, to recognize. So now my question to you, um, you know, uh, all of the panelists that you, that you are, is about what we do now with all of this, because uh, resistance has always existed. Um, even in the example that Adam was giving, already if they had to tame people, if they had to fight, if they had to get munition, it meant that people were resisting and that people were organizing. If already uh, at that time, people could make caricatures and, uh, and draw you know, King Leopold and activists could organize and show what he was doing, uh, even if it, he was the target, but there were already people who knew that it was in, inhuman and morally wrong, uh, you know, the, 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 the business of, of colo, colo, coloni, uh, colonization. So today, in the tradition of that, there are still people resisting. There are still people fighting. And I think Jean-Marie is in that, in that tradition. Uh, tradition um, Patricia, you are and Michael and, and, and Esmeralda also, everyone in their way is doing something. And I wanna hear, and I want people also to hear about those actions that we are taking today to change and to rewrite history, not only for Congo and Belgium, but for all Africans on the continent and in the diaspora. Uh, I'll start with, with Esmeralda, thank you. Thank you, uh, Kumba. Well, I think the first thing is that we have to call uh, facts and words how they are. We should not be afraid by the C word. So the C word colonization, the C word capitalism, which are doing so much harm, not only to people, but to the planet. And they are completely linked. So we have to denounce that. And we have, I'm a journalist. I want to talk about it in, the, in my articles. I want to convince people of the fact that uh, problems today, inequality, poverty, uh, climate destruction, are all coming back from colonialism, from slavery, from racism. So that's one thing important. Um, we mentioned before the illegal flow coming out of Africa. Yes, let's be clear. People say, look, the Western country, European country, bring a lot of aid to Africa. Thank God the rich country are helping the global South. This is not true. I mean, yes, it's true, the aid coming, but there's about $40 billion different from what is coming out of Africa. Uh, in repayment of interest uh, to the debt, in the, of course, profit from foreign companies and those illegal flows, laundering of money that we were uh, talking before. So this is, again, a narrative that has to be changed. There is aid, but there's much more on the other side coming out of Africa. So I think that's important. And to say that I don't think Africa and the global South in general needs aid or charity. They need justice, justice like fair trade, justice like repairing the past, justice in the whole narrative. So this is something I'm, I'm trying to do in, uh, in my job of uh, film uh, maker and uh, journalist and activist and bring as many people as possible uh, from the world to, to recognize that. Thank you so much. So telling the stories, writing it, uh, reaching out to people who don't know or don't want to know or don't want to see, but putting it in front so that nobody can say that they didn't know the connections uh, and is, is, is part of the action. And thank you for, for, for doing that. 
Uh, I want to come to, to Michael. I know you've been working a lot also in this field and uh, especially around the issues of reparation and currently supporting um, the Rewrite History Initiative with Africans Rising, where we are really looking at challenging all of these colonial powers, basically, who, you know, based on, 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 on white supremacy to face the crimes of the past, but also face today the interactions, you know, how the, the nations are interacting, how people are interacting based on that extraction uh, of, of riches uh, from, from the continent. So Michael, can you tell us more about what, what you're doing today, what you're working on? Mm -hmm. Yes, thank you, Kumba. Yes, justice uh, rather than aid, uh, you know, that is uh, 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 justice instead of aid, that, that would be a good motto. But uh, um, yes, I think we, uh, we in the European network of people of African descent, of which I'm proud to be a, a co-founder, um, we have Oh, we, and we are supporting calls for reparations around the world since we were founded in 2014, including this current uh, campaign by Africans Rising, which I think is 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 amazing and and um, you know might even uh, turn out to be um, a, a bit historic. Um, and that is the you know your your rewrite history um, campaign. Now, when it comes to reparations, a lot of people tend to confuse or conflate reparations with merely financial compensation. And I think that all of us on the panel, and I would think in Africans rising to, would say that reparations is much more than merely financial compensation. And that reparations is not about financial compensation per se, but rather about rectifying, if you will, structural injustices that are rooted in historical uh, injustices and restoring uh, human dignity and, and, and um, yes, creating more just structures and, and ways of organizing things, including, uh, for instance, the, the economy. And so, when um, we uh, are calling for reparations, we also have this broader view of, of reparations, which is a view that is shared by many in the, uh, and I would say maybe even most in the reparations movement today that is, that is uh, has become, I would say, a global movement, for example, with the call for rep reparatory justice and its 10-point program the 10-point program for reparatory justice um, by the 15 member states of the Caribbean community for the histories and legacies of enslavement, native genocide, and the systemic racism of colonialism, the growing calls for reparations in the U.S. Uh, by, for instance, the Black Lives Matter movement, the National African American Reparations Commission, and now also this new HR 40 uh, bill, or oh, is not all that new yet, it was pushed by a congressman by the name of John Conyers since 1989 and is now pushed by Sheila Jackson in the, um, in, 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 in the Congress and, and Cory Booker in the, um, in, in the Senate. And um, Yes, I think, you know, these sorts of calls for reparations talk about reparations as way broader than merely financial uh, compensation. And if we look at uh, it uh, in, have this, if you will, structural view of, of reparations, which, by the way, is also shared by the UN Special Rapporteur on Racism, Tendaji Achume, who um, wrote a the first UN report on reparations for colonialism and enslavement, which was presented to the General Assembly last year. This sort of uh, view of reparations is, uh, uh, we should see it as part of a broader push towards new social and international orders that are firmly based on a respect for human dignity and non-discrimination, and which serve to replenish nature in contrast to as it is now, uh, 
and make no mistake as uh, also um the, uh, also um <laughs> yes princess just mentioned um that these practices um of uh, these unsustainable uh, practices that are uh, you know uh, damaging uh, our uh, nature beyond repair are firmly rooted in certain centuries of colonialism that exploit both human beings and nature in ways that are now quite literally taking us to the brink of death. So uh, this view of, of um, this view of, of reparations also uh, connects it to to um, the environmental movement and uh, to creating as you know the sustainable so-called sustainable development goals uh, say um, social economic and environmentally sustainable development Thanks. so uh, this is this is a a, a a view of of reparations that I think we should all stand behind. Thank you so much, Michael. Please make sure, and this is not only to Michael, but to all of the, the panelists, if you have any resources, links, uh, website that people can go to, please paste it in the chat because people uh, might be able to learn more, hear more of what, you, you know, what you're working on. Uh, I'm going to move quickly uh, to, to Patricia about also actions. I know that today uh, there's a lot of work being done and the same way that she said earlier that, you know, we, we have a history, uh, you know, even before, um, you know, the encounter of, 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 of white supremacists. And there is also today, there are many actions, many things going on um, to, to change things. Uh, Patricia. Um, thank you again for the opportunity. Um, as I'm listening to Michael speak and the word reparation keeps repeating itself. And what comes to me is with reparation first needs to be recognition. And in order for a whole empire that has imposed itself in a black community to, 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 to recognize something, there's a resistance that comes with that. And I think it's our responsibility to, to in, in, in us asking for rep reparations, understanding the psychological effects of what has happened to us and to stand on the shoulders of those that have come before us. When we look at Pan-Africanism and we look at people such as Kwame Nkrumah, and we, we just learned about Lumumba, and we look at Sekou Toure, we look at Marcus Garvey. These, the, this for me is a part of a reparation in Blacks understanding who they are and understanding their power. That to me is reparation when we ourselves understand our power within ourselves so that when we approach our when we are, approach our predecessor, they know that we're not coming to ask, but we're coming to demand what we should have had before this oppression was put upon us. I say this because in how we work, we understand the importance of building and strengthening and organizing and understanding our history as Africans in order for us to feel empowered and strengthened, in order for us to be able to make the difference that was not that, that we're not allowed at times due to the oppression that's being put upon us. Uh, one of the things that we do in the work uh, with the youth in the Democratic Republic of Congo is first understanding who you are as a Congolese. Uh, we have this history where we talk about slavery, we talk about Leopold, we talk about uh, all these aspects of what history represents to us, but what we, we make sure they do not forget who Kimpavita is. We make sure they do not forget who Simo Kimbangu is. We make sure that they do not forget that within this resilience that we have within us exist those that put themselves in the front line, just like what we saw as Adam mentioned, so that they can fight for truth and to put truth to power. I say this because I feel that um, in, in progress, sometimes in order for you to, to jump ahead, you sometimes have to take a step back. And in a lot of the work that we do, we take the time in studying those things. Uh, a lot of the youth, we, we've done work with our brothers and sisters who are in Ghana in teaching us sometimes the history that we are not given in the Congo, 
in the line of work that I've done, some of the questions uh, inside of Congo Love, we talk about the history, we talk about colonialism, we talk about neocolonialism. And one of the trainings that we did, we had a 60 year old man who came into the training that started crying and was asking himself, why did I not know about Kimpavita? Why did I not know about Pan-Africanism? Why did I not know about my history, but I knew about Belgium? I knew about Europe. And I think in reparations, and I think Michael mentioned it in education, the structure that has been today, I believe still imposed on us because the governments that we have today within Africa are not the governments that existed in Africa prior to colonization. We had governments, we had systems. So when we look at reparations, how does reparations look like? Is it something that they put on a paper like they put on what democracy looks like? What does uh, systems of government looks like for us? If you look at even in the Congo, uh, we talk about Ubuntu, I am because uh, we are. That is socialism. That is a form of socialism that existed before when we look at what capitalism and what it represents today, where you have a small group of people exploiting the larger numbers. And that's what we see in the Congo. And uh, Esmeralda mentioned that. We need to call it for what it is. It's colonialism. It is capitalism. It is existing today. The Congolese continue to suffer from it. It makes no sense to me that we have a country with over 80 million people with half of them under the age of 25 and we have a 96% unemployment rate. How is it we have a country that has the capacity to feed the African continent twice over, but we are living with $2 a day and people are starving we have to ask ourselves, why is this happening? Who are the culprits that are behind these injustices happening to not just Congolese, to blacks in Ferguson, to blacks in Chicago, to blacks in New York, to blacks in Belgium? Who are the people behind what is currently happening, not only on the African continent, but worldwide? And why is it that our brothers and sisters need to find themselves running away from their own homes to cross the Mediterranean Sea as what we saw during slavery, the same ocean where millions of Africans drowned. Today, we see it happening today. What is happening within our continent? I think we need to ask these hard questions and not just paint a picture, but we really need to more dig deeper within ourselves and ask ourselves, why don't I know that in the Congo today, there's over 6 million lives that have been lost in the Congo? Why do I not know this? Why does not CNN not talk about this? Why does France 24 not talk about this? What do they gain from this? Why is it that in the Democratic Republic of Congo, we have the UN, which had one of the largest number of soldiers over 20,000 for 20 years, and nothing has changed. And where the mineral resources lie in the East is where the rape is happening, is where, is where the multinational companies are. And we need to look within our neighbors. Mm. Congo today, with nine countries surrounding it, what affects the Congo today affects automatically nine countries around the Congo, thus affecting Africa, thus affecting the world. Hmm. Why don't we know what's happening in the heart of Africa? And just to finish off, I always say, today we are all humans. Without our hearts, we don't function. I can live without my arm. I can live without my leg. But the minute my heart stops beating, I no longer can function. So right now the heart of Africa is having a heart attack and we're wondering why the African continent is not able to move forward. Until we fix this heart from bleeding, until we look at this heart and ask ourselves, why is this happening? And we fix these issues, the African continent will not, will, will not move forward. Thank you. Thank you, Patricia, for, for um, what you just shared. And um, I, will, I will move to um, Jean-Marie also quickly because I'm just in the interest of time uh, to tell us also about their work. Because like, as you're saying right now, there are people correcting this, bringing back the stories, teaching day in and day out, maybe not under many light or being you know, seen, but still doing the work and in very difficult you know, condition. Uh, Jean-Marie, uh, please share uh, what you are working on. Je voudrais souligner quelque chose. La Belgique nous a retardé à plus de 500 ans en arrière. Nous sommes en train de nous battre pour rattraper ce retard. 
nous battre comment Déjà, et la Belgique n'a pas euh, procédé même de la même manière que d'autres pays colonisateurs du Congo, euh, de, de, de l'Afrique. La Belgique, euh, vraiment, nous a eu à nous étouffer sérieusement. Et raison pour laquelle euh, nous sommes en train de former cette génération pour, pour qu'elle connaisse son histoire, sa vraie histoire en réalité. Pour certaines personnes, elles croyaient que l'histoire du Congo a commencé avec le roi Léopold II. Le jeune Congolais ou les Congolais en général, même de vieux, ce qui ont étudié avant, euh, ne connaissaient que l'histoire de la Belgique et non l'histoire du Congo. On a tout effacé de nous en réalité. Et c'est ça ce que nous voulons maintenant rétablir. Et actuellement, quand nous voyons nos gouvernements, il y a toujours des puissances étrangères, y compris même la Belgique, qui joue un rôle. Et nous le voyons même, le président Tshisekedi, à chaque fois, il se rend à, à la Belgique, en Belgique. Mais en réalité, la situation du Congo ne change pas. Ce n'est pas ce que la Belgique va nous présenter aujourd'hui qui peut nous rassurer, en réalité. Moi, je, euh, je vois cela comme étant une distraction. Euh, nous devons plutôt nous mettre au travail parce que personne ne va nous libérer si nous-mêmes nous ne nous libérons pas. S'ils si veulent réellement que le Congolais puisse, euh, euh, puisse récupérer son humanisme, ils n'ont qu'à poser des actes sur le plan international qui vont faire en sorte que cela soit établi ou soit rétabli, mais ne pas continuer à nous distraire. Actuellement, nous avons une génération euh, qui n'est plus euh, colérique comme euh, celle d'avant, parce qu'on venait fraîchement euh, d'accéder euh, à l'indépendance. Euh, nous voulons qu'il y ait une collaboration, mais qu'il y ait une collaboration sincère, pas une distraction. Parce que quand les gens approchent le Congo, c'est pour les richesses du Congo et non autre chose. Raison pour laquelle la situation ne change pas en réalité. C'est ça le travail que nous sommes en train de faire. Mais nous sommes piégés de partout, même quand nous voyons notre constitution. Notre constitution tire ses origines d'où Quand on parle de dialogue en République démocratique du Congo, c'est toujours la Belgique. Raison pour laquelle aujourd'hui là, les mouvements citoyens ont eu à réunir toute la société civile congolaise. Actuellement, nous sommes en pleine démarche pour les réformes, les réformes électorales. Donc, partout, dans toutes les lois de la République démocratique du Congo, il y a des pièges et des pièges qui conduisent toujours à, 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 à des climats non paisibles. Il y a manque de justice en réalité. Et des fois, même quand le peuple congolais fait son choix, on lui présente une autre personne. C'est ce qui se passe toujours au Congo. C'est ça la situation que nous avons même actuellement. Raison pour laquelle rien ne marche. Rien ne marche. Nous ne faisons que reculer. Et nous ne voyons pas les bons cœurs que la Belgique veut faire du Congo aujourd'hui. Et là, ce n'est pas, quand je dis ça, ce n'est pas pour euh, demander à la Belgique ou supplier à la Belgique de faire quelque chose. Nous-mêmes, nous sommes capables de le faire. Si les autres viendront, ils viendront que nous compléter. C'est ça ce que nous disons euh, à, à la jeunesse congolaise actuellement et à tous les Congolais. Et nous sommes en train de procéder aux réformes, que les lois du Congo soient créées par des Congolais eux-mêmes. Les conflits qu'il y a eu entre Patrice Emery Lumumba et le président Kassavoub à l'époque étaient une constitution construite par la Belgique. 
La Belgique savait qu'il y avait ces pièges-là. Aujourd'hui, nous avons des problèmes à Minemboué. Ça vient d'où Ça vient des de, 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 de accords de, de Sun City. Ça vient des accords de Sun City. Mais il y avait aussi la Belgique dans cette démarche. Les Banyamouleng et les Rwandais qui réclament aujourd'hui les terres, les terres euh, 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 congolaises. Les Rwandais qui sont dans le gouvernement congolais et qui nous sèment des désordres, bien que nous sommes tous africains. Mais qui, qui crée tous ces désordres-là C'est toujours la Belgique et d'autres pays dans, dans le monde. Merci. Merci. Et puis aujourd'hui le Congo. Oui, alors le travail que nous sommes en train de faire et d'enseigner ces jeunes-là, de leur montrer leur vraie histoire, parce qu'il est dit il faut reculer pour mieux sauter. Alors nous devons retracer notre vraie histoire pour que nous mieux avancer. Merci. Thank you so much, Jean-Marie, for all of the work that you are doing, organizing day in and out young people in the Congo, not only teaching them history, uh, but also working with them to face, actually stand and face injustice as it happened today. Uh, we know uh, all that you've been working on with all of the movements, youth movements in the Congo, uh, standing to fight uh, for a different type of Congo. And, and putting your lives on the line uh, every day. So we, we have to thank you for that. Thank you so much. We, will, we are caught by time, but I need you to give me calls of actions. Uh, people have heard about the history. People have heard about your work, uh, all of the things that you are doing. But we, they also need some people want, and it's, it's already in the chat, they're ready. They want to support. Where should they go? What should they do? Who do you want to call and what do you want them to do? I need you to do it very briefly, but if anybody's listening and they might be not listening today, but they might listen tomorrow. Uh, they have to les gens qui veulent soutenir. Yes. Qui, uh, qu'est-ce qu'ils doivent faire? What should they do? I will start with you, Jean-Marie. Euh, je leur demande euh, de nous suivre euh, donc sur quatrièmevoie.org. Euh, nous avons euh, un site euh, internet. Nous avons des pages euh, aussi euh, Facebook que nous euh, suivons fréquemment. Euh, voilà, euh, ils peuvent tout, dans ces quatrièmes voies, il est en RDC. Donc, euh, ils peuvent toutefois euh, nous contacter à partir de là et nous allons réagir euh, directement. Et il y a encore l'adresse email quatrième euh, voix 16 aéroba gmail.com. Quatrième voix 16 aéroba gmail.com. Thank you so much, Jean-Marie. Please type the website, the email in the chat, um, and also the calls to action, some of the things that are urgent that people need to contribute to, talk about, make the information, what stories people should write about, and let the world know about okay. the work that you are doing today um, in, 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 in the Congo. I'm uh, moving to Michael. Call for action, Michael. What, who would you call, what should they do? Michael. Oh, thank you, Kumba. Yes, um, there are very many things that people could do. I don't even know uh, where to uh, begin, frankly. But uh, I think we all need to uh, organize, 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 as they say. And so if you're not already involved in a civil society organization, make sure that you are. And I would say second, join the rewrite history campaign of the Africans Rising. Um, and third, I would say uh, those who are involved in civil society organizations, We need to do a better job in, in, in working together, creating campaigns that are both national and international, pushing ourselves and each other to be more creative in our advocacy and how we raise public awareness 
how we engage policymakers, and how we campaign. And um, fourth, I would say, let your policymakers, governments, parliaments, um, political parties, regional organizations, including the African Union and the European Union, know, uh, uh, let them know that you want them to support reparations and also on enter neocolonialism. And I think this is, as Jean-Marie uh, pointed, uh, you know, uh, said um, uh, that the self-determination of and sovereignty of the natural resources of the Congo and other African countries is a critical, critical uh, issue. And that is where the fight has to be both at the national uh, level, I mean, and also at the regional African Union level, I would say, and also, but also at the international UN level, we need to fight at all these uh, levels, if you will, to to put an end to economic um, neocolonialism. Oh. There are other things uh, that I can think of, but that is that. Those are a few things. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, moving fast, Patricia, a call to action. Sure. Uh, I think the first thing that comes to me is there, there's power in numbers. The forces that we're fighting against have shown what they are capable of doing. If you look into history, when uh, we come together, we don't have arms, but we do have numbers and we do have power in those numbers. And I think that it's very, very important that we first start by educating ourselves, educating ourselves, not just on what's going on in, in the Congo, but what is happening on the African continent and making those connections and understanding that what is happening in the Congo affects what is happening in Cameroon, affects what is happening in Ghana and what is happening in Senegal and what is happening he even here in the USA. The second thing I would say is um, a lot of times people, people completely want to know, what do I do? Get involved. Africansrising.org, friendsofthecongo.org, congolove.org. You know, that there's all these different organizations that exist that people are coming together. And in order for us to build those numbers and to build that power, we must be involved, not just donate and give $25. Money is great. But as Michael said, we need to, 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 we need to find our educators, our visionaries, the people who are teachers, the people who are engineers, the people who know tech. We need to bring our brain power together. And by bringing our brain power together, use these same tools that God has given us to be able to give back to the community, give back to Africa, to give back to these organizations. Because like I said, the power that we're fighting against is fighting with the amount of money that no matter how much we fundraise, it will never be enough because they've shown what they are ready to do in order to maintain that power. So it comes back to us educating ourselves, volunteering for those that are not able. I know with coronavirus, people are, are scared to get out there Technology is a great tool that can be used to read, educate yourself, donate, of course, is always helpful because it helps the, the work move forward. And the last thing I just want to say is take the time to, to build that solidarity that we saw during the apartheid, what the solidarity that we see in Palestine, the solidarity that we see in Cuba when coronavirus came. The one country that the world has looked down upon that said that they were incapable of, they send doctors across the world to help in a time where no, no, no imperialistic nation could even figure it out, there Cuba was. That's the kind of solidarity that, that I feel we need with one another, where it's not just based on materialistic resources, but being present, being there. Go to Congo, go to Ghana. Go to your brother who is your neighbor and ask him those questions and say, how can I help? How can I learn and how can I contribute? Thank you. Thank you, Patricia. Thank you, Michael. Thank you, Esmeralda. Thank you, Jean-Marie. And thank you, Adam, for all of this um, that you shared today. We will uh, go toward the other phase of this conversation where we will hear from uh, the public. And um, there are many, many comments. I know uh, some of you have been already reading them. There are also questions that you can respond to directly that are directly directed to you. Uh, but I want to thank you again and thank all of the people who are present uh, on, this, on, on this call. Um, I know we've been collecting some of the, some of the questions. 
uh, I quickly will go to uh, people are you know asking. Of course, it's some of the same that 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 we've been also asking uh, about organizing. What do we do from here? How do we make the change happen? People are asking questions about how to connect with the different organization in the different uh, actions that, that, that we're working with. I, I see many hands that are raised. Uh, I believe it will be easier if the questions can be typed. Uh, I know that there is in the Q&A uh, section, a different, um, different questions that are already you know, written there. To, 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 to ask you uh, to, to, to respond to that. Uh, I'll come back just um, you know, for, for a minute to um, Esmeralda and ask you uh, to talk about you know, the, the, what is happening in Belgium right now. Because when we talk about change, it's about change globally. Things have to change in the Congo, they have to change in Belgium, they have to change in the US. We've seen movements of people also in Belgium, um, young people and even also young people, you know, bringing down the statue, uh, risking going to jail and paying fine. Uh, we've seen also uh, a commission being put together around truth and reconciliation. We want to hear more about what, what is this about? You are a journalist, you can tell us what is it really about? What can we expect or not expect from it? What should we do to push it further? That, that would be um, you know, one of the questions uh, we, we have here. Thank you. Well, one of the problem in, in Belgium was because there was that taboo about uh, colonialism, colonial period. Uh, it was not taught in the schools. And uh, Patricia said how important it is education in Congo. And I would say education in Belgium is really important for the people to know what happened, to know about the past. And so that's one of the things which will be happening now is that the, the program in the school will uh, have a part now on that past and Congo and, and colonialism. So that's a big step. But you have to realize that that has been demanded by the diaspora for a very long time. And it only happens now because there was this uh, global emotion around the, the murder of George Floyd and all those uh, manifestation protests by Black Lives Matter, also in Belgium. And then the statues started to fall down. It was very emotional. It was very powerful. And on that, we could build an action which was once education in the school about a colonial past, and secondly, a commission which has started now to open up all the archives and to discuss between Belgium and between people from the diaspora, Congo, Rwanda, Burundi, about what really happened and what we can do to, to build uh, bridges and alliances and I, I really believe that it's one way forward that we can go, as also Patricia and Jean-Marie said, we have to put people together. It was wonderful to see how many uh, white people in the US joined the Black Lives Matter protest. It was the same in Europe, and we have to continue this, uh, this movement. And education, of course, is, uh, is very important. Thank you so much. Um, Michael, there, there is a question about um, the possibility of, you know, having an international tri tribunal also about, about, you know, these crimes of the past. Um, and, you know, you've talked about reparation. Uh, is that part of what you also, you know, are envisioning or working on? Is this, is this one of the possibility? Because people are talking also I mean, there was not only, you know, the king uh, that benefited and the government of Belgium, but we're talking about also the um, business who have benefited and who are still benefiting today. So there's many people who have to respond to these crimes and to be able to rewrite history. It has to be done at very, very many different levels. Mm -hmm. 
Yes, Kumba. Yes, thank you. Who uh, I was trying to find uh, who um, uh, asked that uh, question, if I might know the person. But uh, yes, I think the idea of a uh, international tribunal on on reparations is an excellent idea and one that has been discussed um, previously and suggested by by several uh, people, among them. Uh, Ambassador David Comisong to uh, Ambassador Barbados to uh, to the Caribbean community. So yes, this is an idea that has been discussed, and this is an idea I think that will need to be uh, realized in the future. Hopefully, like a UN tribunal or something like this, because unfortunately, as it is today, the International Court of Justice. Is does not have the um, legal or institutional infrastructure, if you will, to uh, effectively handle the uh, issue of reparations, at least not in any comprehensive manner. So yes, international tribunals uh, for reparations, let's push for that, no doubt. Thank you, and thank you so much. Um, there are questions that are coming from everywhere and in very different, you know, facets. Um, as somebody's rising, uh, you know, raising questions and talking about, you know, Chinese involvement in in the, in the, in the Congo today, and and of course, um, uh, somebody was saying uh, not only the Congo but all of Africa uh, becomes again a place where everybody is fighting for territories. Everybody wants to have their military. Everybody wants to make sure that their business are set up and, and that they are, are protected. But everybody also wants to put in place government that would be friendly to them, whether it's China, Russia, US, or, 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 or Europe. Uh, anybody wants to, to take on, on, on that question? Um, Patricia or Jean-Marie? Um. I would actually like to take on to uh, that question. I want to just say uh, in solidarity with our Bolivian brothers and sisters, their elections was just yesterday and uh, they were able to have a leader that represents the people's voice. Today, what we see going on, sorry, one second. Um, well, today, what we see going on, yes, sorry, one second. Uh, to, Today, what we see going on in the Democratic Republic of Congo is what we see all across uh, North America, what we see across Palestine, and what we see in different parts of the world. Why I say that, during the elections of the Democratic Republic of Congo, one of the things that happened was we did not see a leader that was representing the people. When we start seeing elections happening, where the leadership is representing the people, I think that's also a part of what we look at reparation and regress, right? Uh, what does it mean when a Congolese goes out and votes? We have uh, in the east of the Democratic Republic of Congo where three million Congolese were excluded from voting and the, and the excuse was because of Ebola. But right after the elections, we didn't see that. And then till today, if you look in the Democratic Republic of Congo, the Congolese don't have the results to their, to, to, to their ballots. Where are, the, where are our results? Where's my vote? How do I know that what you're telling me is what actually is the truth? And when we speak of neocolonialism, that is what we're seeing today, not just happening in the Congo, but worldwide, where leaders are selected for the people. And I think that the change that we, we may seek, and when I think of reparations in, in, in my own terms, is let's start by us picking our own leaders and you guys staying out of our elections. And you guys staying out of acknowledging when you know that the people do not want this leader, you still recognize them and still do business with them. After you know that these, these leaders are creating oppression on the people in the working class, we need to ask ourselves, how, are, how is the working class benefiting from the resources that are coming from their countries? We see this happening over and over and over again. And I think what we just need to, to, to remind ourselves when we look at even what has happened in the East and today where we had 10 years ago, where we had the UN mapping report that came out from the United Nations until today, nothing has happened. So we're talking about 500, 120 or however many years from now, where 10 years from now, we can't even get answers to that. And then we have leadership that's been imposed on the people 
who are not able to defend their territories, defend their resources, defend their minerals, defend their grounds. Why? Because as long as we have an imperialistic predator that is consistently having their hands in the pockets of every African on that continent because it belongs to us all, we will continue to have to answer to them until we take power and we understand that the power exists within the people. So it goes back to what do we do? We organize, 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 as Michael has said. Thank you so much, uh, Patricia. Somebody named actually, uh, you know, a uh, business, uh, Imicor, uh, the current name of the Union Minière du Katanga, the same one that um, Adam referred to in the beginning. Uh, seems like, uh, you know, corporations, uh, you know, continue their, their business over, over, you know, years and years, and they morph into new ones. And uh, how do we, yeah, how do we, uh, you know, hold them accountable even today from what, because what they've been able to, to collect and amass uh, has been done uh, through crime and it's still going on today, uh, Jean-Marie. Euh, oui, moi je pense que je dois directement euh, compléter euh, Patricia, donc par rapport au temps. Oui, euh, je prends le cas de M. Félix Tshisekedi, le président. À chaque fois, il effectue des voyages pour la Belgique. Nulle part, la Belgique lui a posé la question de savoir qu'est-ce qui a été les résultats réels des élections qui ont fait en sorte qu'il devienne président de la République. Là déjà, ça fait montre que euh, tout ce que fait la Belgique actuellement, ce n'est que du semblant. Si la Belgique commence à procéder ainsi sur le plan diplomatique, cela va faire croire aux Congolais que les choses avancent réellement. Euh, nous sommes dans une situation où euh, il y a du pillage dans notre pays, tout celui qui approche le Congolais, c'est pour avoir quelque chose. Et là, ça nous fait mal. Et quand on dit quelque chose, c'est ce n'est pas seulement avoir quelque chose et rien laisser d'autre, mais ça laisse de mort. C'est tous les jours que le Congolais meurt par les armes, par la faim, Aujourd'hui, nous avons 96% de taux de chômage et tant d'autres choses. Quand on parle de choses, bon, excusez-moi, quand je parle, je parle vraiment avec mon cœur parce que c'est ça, c'est que je suis en train de vivre dans mon pays. Et euh, je peux dire, c'est que mes, mes arrière grands parents ont subi dans la colonisation. Moi, je suis en train de les subir parce qu'à tout moment, je suis arrêté. Et oui, aujourd'hui, euh, avec celui qui est là, euh, on sent une douceur apparente. Mais je sais que lorsque ses intérêts seront vraiment menacés, il sera plus dangereux que Kabila qui est passé. Et surtout, le même Kabila est aussi euh, dans les alentours. Donc, euh, c'est une situation euh, que la communauté internationale, la Belgique et tant d'autres pays, euh, doivent euh, vraiment euh, gérer. Donc, le Congo, euh, on doit arrêter euh, de, de piller le Congo. Et nous, nous travaillons euh, sur terrain, nous sommes prêts à donner nos vies comme euh, nos aïeux l'ont fait pour que nous ayons un Congo réellement libre. Dans notre hymne national, il est dit « Nous peuplerons ton sol et nous assurerons ta grandeur ». Aujourd'hui, le sol congolais est de peuplé. C'est à tout moment que les Congolais meurent. C'est à cause de qui C'est à cause de ces pays ou de ces, de ces États entre parenthèses, grandes puissances, et qui utilisent d'autres États, même africains, ou d'autres régimes africains, pour euh, nuire les Congolais. Aujourd'hui, le Congo est visé par tous les États du monde. Donc, le contexte du Congo n'est pas le même contexte que d'autres pays dans le monde. C'est tout le monde qui voit le Congo et aujourd'hui, nous donnons raison. Pourquoi Kwame Kouma, Sekou Touré, Franz Fanon et autres disaient que 
le Congo, c'est le point de départ. Donc, ces gens-là étaient des visionnaires du africanisme, des peuples que Thomas Sankara nous a laissés. Donc, moi, je préfère que euh, nous puissions rester euh, congolais, africains, ne pas compter des autres. Nous allons nous battre seuls jusqu'au point de libérer notre pays ainsi que le continent africain. Thank you so much, um, Jean-Marie. There are questions on the Q&A. People are asking about numbers. I'm sure Adam can give us some uh, with, uh, he already you know, made some, some numbers, uh, 10 million deaths estimated, I think that I heard, but also people are talking about 6 million deaths. This is recent, this is not like from the past. So that makes about 16 million people Um, in the Congo, I, I just, uh, the magnitude of that, I, I wonder if people just, uh, you know, uh, really um, uh, rea realize that there are questions about, about, about that. Um, and there are also uh, more questions about, yeah, there are also, and I, and I want some of you maybe to, 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 to come also to, to, to that. There are more questions about That even the, the, the tribunal that we just talked about and, you know, this commission, people are asking, uh, will this be uh, enough? Will, the, will, it, will it take us where we want to go? Um, will it be hijacked by, you know, a minor, minority of people and then people will not benefit? Uh, then, you know, I saw questions also on the reparation part where people are saying, What if reparation, and I think they were, they were alluring to reparation as financial, uh, what if that money gets to the wrong hand? Because, of course, we are talking right now about, uh, you know, having the wrong leadership at this point. These are questions that people are putting. Uh, anybody wants to, 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 to take them? No way. Yes, I will get Adam first on, 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 the, on the history and on the number and then... Um, Michael also on the reparation. Yes, Adam. Uh, on the numbers, uh, the figure I gave of a shrinkage of population of 10 million people, I talk about the shrinkage of population instead of deaths, because even though many of those 10 million people were in fact killed, something that happens under a slave labor system is that people stop having children and the population shrinks from that reason. And it still remains astonishing to me that when the world thinks about mass deaths, we think of something like the Holocaust in Europe, but we don't put what happened in King Leopold's Congo in the same category. And we should, because there was a loss of life just that great. Uh, there are disputes about just how many people have uh, died there in the last uh, Uh, 20, 23 years during this period of, of civil warfare, uh, but it is certainly in the millions, exactly where in the millions, we will never, we will never know. Uh, let me just say one thing on the subject of reparations, and then I'll yield to people who know more about this than me. Sometimes I wonder even if reparations is the right word for this reason, Reparations is usually thought of as something where a wrong was done, you pay some money to somebody, and it's all taken care of. And I don't think it's as simple as that, because these wrongs that have been done over many centuries are continued today in the way that Africa relates to the rest of the world and in the international trading system. Um, You know, we, uh, the way that world trade is structured is for the benefit of multinational corporations. It is not structured for the benefit of people on the ground in the poorer countries of the world. And I think anything we can do to draw attention to that and to think of this as making some small kind of atonement for all the wrongs that have been done in the past or a beginning of that atonement would be all uh, to the good. Thank you so much, yes. Adam. Michael. Yes, thank you, Kumba. Thank you, Adam. Um, yes, I think uh, there are a few things here to uh, uh, keep in mind. One is 
there's no solution, there's no one fixed uh, solution to all the various problems that colonialism has left in its wake, if you will. And as we said in the beginning, um, colonialism and its legacies have many dimensions, including educational, cultural dimensions, but also social, economic, political, and so forth. And these dimensions are both national and international. And so, as Adam correctly points out, uh, for instance, if you was to give, uh, say, Congo a sum of money, of course, that will not fix uh, Congo's role in the global economy, for instance, right? So this is this is this is um, all all good and correct. But now, when we talk about reparations, uh, you know, this is also why we need to be very specific about what exactly what we're talking about. And if you look at um, the Caribbean community community of fifty member states, and their call for what they call reparatory justice, they are calling on European states to help them fund and develop and implement a 10-point program for reparatory justice, which includes things uh, such as an indigenous people's development program, illiteracy eradication, addressing the public health crisis, technology transfer and debt cancellation, and you know, other things. So, that is clearly something, uh, you know, a program for reparatory justice that is not merely about financial compensation. And I don't think there is anyone hardly in the reparations movement today that I think is becoming global that has this sort of uh, exclusive financial view on, on, on reparations. And we all recognize that, that reparations especially if we think of it in financial terms, will certainly not fix all the problems that ail Congo and other former colonized countries in Africa and uh, elsewhere. Thank you so much, uh, Michael. And uh, what I'm hearing in this part of some of the questions that have been raised, people are talking about still the fact that it's not finished, that, that it is, there is still things happening on the continent and, and every one of you have, have alerted to it. And Af at Africans Rising, uh, one of the, the, the movement really reason for existing has been to say that there is an unfinished biz business of African liberation. It means that still today, our, our hands are tied and Jean-Marie mentioned it in talking about there are traps even in the, the systems that, that, that we live in. That, that makes us still, uh, you know, in, in some ways uh, enslaved. So th there is a need to actually br still break the chains uh, and, 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 and make sure that, that people, uh, you know, ha have, have self-determination. So how, how do we go about this? Because uh, really the illicit financial flow that, that you know, Esmeralda mentioned, uh, uh, you know, all of these pieces are part of what shows us that still today we live in a system, in a global system that is basically uh, feeding white supremacy and feeding a certain number of people uh, or nations uh, and most of the time some cooperation and basically extracting a lot from Africa, of course, the Congo is just so blatant, but it's across Africa and it's concentrating th that wealth there, but destruct, dis destru destroying in the process people's lives, culture, and environment. How do we go about this as, as a people? Because uh, uh, this work goes beyond the Congo, beyond Africa. It's really about all of humanity, if you know, in, 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 in understanding that, that this way is, is, is just the wrong way that the whole humanity is going. So, Mike, I'll give you just another minute because I see that you wanted to say something. Um, and then I'll, I'll go to, to Esmeralda and, and, and back to, to Patricia. You know, I just wanted to add to what I said previously that. Uh, Although we do recognize and we should recognize that 
that the legacies of colonialism have many uh, dimensions of injustice, if you will, uh, that we need to, to address. We should also, and that we should not reduce reparations to a matter of financial uh, compensation. And as someone pointed out, I think you said, Kumba, that uh, also that uh, what if we were to give uh, money to, to uh, today's government in Congo and elsewhere, uh, that would be deeply, of course, problematic. But uh, at the same time, we should, of course, not let Belgium and other former colonial states off the hook. And we should be very clear that not only did Belgium commit, uh, you know, terrible atrocities and crimes against humanity, against the Congolese people, but they have never been held responsible for this, never held accountable for this, and let alone made amends for it. And that just doubles, if you will, the wrongdoing. And on top of these two wrongdoings, Belgium is continuing to perpetrate injustices uh, against the Congolese uh, people, among other things, uh, economically, as we uh, and, and supporting, uh, you know, uh, forms of various forms of, of exploitation against the Congolese people and its natural resources. So. Uh, we should definitely at the same time not let Belgium off the hook and, and other uh, uh, European former colonial uh, powers. Thank you. Uh, Esmeralda, and, and there's also a question there, um, you know, Benedict, I think, is the one asking it about Pan-Africanism. And I'll maybe, um, uh, Patricia, you can address that, uh, saying that how can we talk about Pan-Africanism when there are also African countries surrounding Congo benefiting and, you know, uh, hurting the people of, of Congo. So that's, that's out there. But um, Esmeralda first, before we get to that question. Uh, thank you, Kuma. I think Michael is perfectly right. We cannot leave the European countries and, and my country, Belgium, off the hook. I think they should acknowledge uh, the past. I think they should also... Uh, apologize. That has not happened yet. And I think all of the European countries should do it. Because I mean, the, the damage in uh, uh, the American continent, North and South, was also uh, devastating. And all that should be acknowledged and, and, and done. I think that fair trade would be a first step, magnificent one, if it's possible. Also, um, Cancellation of the debt is another thing. There are many things that should be discussed in this, uh, in this process. Now to reply to what Kumba was asking about the system. The system is, is broken. You can see it all over the world. We are going uh, completely to destruction, destruction of people, of uh, the health of the people, of the livelihood of the people, of the planet. And we are in urgent need of changing the system and stopping this uh, pursuit of growth at any cost. Obviously, the developing countries need some sort of growth, but the Western countries should definitely stop this pursuit and try to help the developing country to have another form of growth, which is green, which is sustainable and, and address the, the needs of the people. So I think the one thing we need is decolonize, but decolonize in all aspects, also in the environment uh, movement. There is fantastic activists in Africa, in South America, in the global South. We need to, to listen to their voice. We need to stop thinking that environment solutions are only from the West, because it's not. We need to listen also to indigenous wisdom, because, I mean, we have shown our limit and we, we are really uh, close to catastrophe. So we need to bring back this knowledge of uh, indigenous wisdom, making nature, for example, a legal subject, like some uh, countries in uh, South America are, are proposing 
feeling the earth, thinking with the earth, use our heart more than uh, uh, this continuous uh, race to growth, which is bringing us to the precipice. Thank you so much. And uh, Patricia, um, about um, Pan-Africanism, about attack uh, from you know, other African countries, um, people who are also uh, trying to benefit from you know, the riches of the Congo and can ally with other groups to attack people uh, in, in, in the Congo. What, what, what do you say? Um, I think there's Pan-Africanism and then there's Pan-Africanism. <laughs> I say that to say that um, in the context of neocolonialism, uh, you know, they studied us very well even during colonization in understanding our culture and understanding what moves us and what brings us in. Uh, we could look at a country, for example, such as Rwanda with Kagame, and across the world people will call him a Pan-Africanist. But if someone studies what Pan-Africanism means, you will also understand that the people and the forces that work with Kagame work against those same uh, the structures that build with Pan-Africanists. Pan um, we also look at the same people who are working with the Pan-Africanists as we call as Museveni or Kagame, or the same people who assassinated Lumumba, or the same people who took Kwame Nkrumah out of power. They're the same people who also assassinated many other Pan-Africanists around the world. So I think, um, uh, there's, this, this, there's this mask that's been put. As long as we speak this language, we say what we need to say, as we even look at the African Union today. This is supposed to be a Pan-Africanist uh, institution, but it's being financed not by Africans. You know, We don't see African nations putting in money in African Union and saying when there is a problem happening in the Congo, like, for example, the UN mapping report, why isn't the African Union taking this on? Why do we have to go to the UN to do this? Why isn't the African Union building a team to go look at these issues? But yet they're supposed to be Pan-Africanists. So I think uh, it's important to understand um, what Pan-Africanism means. What are the roots of Pan-Africanism? Even when we look at uh, what happened in the, uh, the Berlin Conference and just understanding how they took that and what it meant for them. Uh, when Kwame Nkrumah brought André Blouin and took André Blouin and sent her to work in the Democratic Republic of Congo is because they didn't look at the borders, because they understood that they, they created the borders to divide and conquer us. They looked beyond the borders. And there were certain systems that they put in place, just like what we talk about, what Jean-Marie has mentioned, uh, as Merelda has mentioned, and Michael has mentioned, is we're working within a system that they created for us to trap us, to work. Uh, it's basically a mousetrap. You're running in circles and you're not going anywhere and you're wondering why and they're watching you from outside the cage and you're thinking you're moving forward but you're just scurrying in circles. So what we need to start looking at is how do we get out of this cage? How do we get out of this mousetrap so that we now start determining what is going on? So I think um, for me personally, uh, that's my perspective and I, uh, Benedicta, she actually is a, 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 one of the, the spokespersons for Likam Mabele. And these are some of the people that you should reach out to. So I know when some of these questions ask, it's, it's, it's an opportunity for people to, to push us to speak, but you guys are the minds, you guys are the brilliant uh, people doing these work. So it's so important that within the groups that we're even seeing right now, that people share the organizations that they're in, because I learned from you, you know, Kumba, uh, you know, Michael, I'm learning from, we, we learn from each other. And that's for me what Pan-Africanism is. And it goes back to Ubuntuism. I am because we are. And when we see African nations not helping each other, not being there for one another, not supporting one another, but they're willing to go to the IMF, the World Bank, the European Union, the USA to get aid before we say there's Ebola in West Africa, how much has Senegal put in? How much has Congo put in? How much has this person put in? And then we can now start determining how we want to solve our own problems. To me, that's when I see... Uh, the form of Pan-Africanism that we need start happening and also exchanging of minds. We have brilliant minds in Senegal. We have brilliant minds in Mali, in Kenya, in Rwanda, in all parts of the world. Where are these engineers? They should be in the Congo right now working in those minds, teaching those young Congolese. How do we exploit our own resources? How do we build our own phones? How do we build our own computers? We don't need China to come teach us how to build a computer and a phone. We can do it ourselves. And 
And an advantage for us is we don't have to get on a plane or on a boat to get this resources. It's right under our feet. To me, that's what Pan-Africanism is in regards to us Africans putting our minds together to build the, the, the continents that we know it has the capacity to be and not always wait for people on the outside to teach us what we already know. Thank you so much. Uh, we're getting to the end of this um, conversation. Just so you can scroll down, read some of the questions, see which one you want to really um, end your, your, your last um, um, intervention on. I'm gonna give the floor to Jean-Marie uh, once again um, and just again, uh, ask him to, to let us know more about these movements. There's so many movements because people are asking, what can we do? How can we help? There's so many organizations, movements, people working in the Congo. We need to name them. We need to put their contacts. Uh, they need to introduce themselves. I know some of them are here on the Zoom call. Some are on the Facebook. Please Hello. tell us more. Jean-Marie. Uh, oui. Uh, actuellement, nous travaillons uh, sur uh, le panafricanisme des peuples. Je sais que nous connaissons l'histoire uh, du continent africain. Uh, nous avons eu uh, de Kwame Kouma, de Sekoutouré et les autres uh, qui ont uh, eu à prôner pour uh, le panafricanisme institutionnel. Mais uh, ça a été vite uh, détruit. Alors, euh, si le panafricanisme se base sur les peuples, les choses euh, vont bien euh, marcher. Et aujourd'hui, euh, le néocolonialisme euh, ne fait que euh, changer de forme par rapport à l'évolution aussi euh, du panafricanisme. Donc, euh, euh, hier, ils étaient en train d'appuyer les individus, raison pour laquelle au sein du continent africain, il y a eu tant de coups d'État militaires juste après les indépendances. Et ces gens ont été appuyés par euh, euh, comment, les Blancs, les Occidentaux. Et aujourd'hui, euh, commencent à utiliser des gouvernements euh, euh, pour attaquer d'autres États au sein euh, du continent. Là, je donne l'exemple même de, de la RDC, où euh, nous voyons même euh, nos matières minières traverser vers la Zambie. Nous voyons nos matières minières traverser vers le Rwanda. Aujourd'hui, le Rwanda est le premier pays producteur euh, du coltan. Et pourtant, sous le sous-sol congolais, il n'y a même pas du coltan. Et là, nous ne pouvons pas parler du panafricanisme. En réalité, entre nous, les frères africains, il n'y a pas de problème. Mais ce qui pose plus de problèmes, ce sont les gouvernements qui sont dictés euh, par euh, d'autres États des Européens, des États américains. Et ça, c'est vous, euh, euh, comment, euh, aux personnes euh, que, 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 que nous choisissons. Euh, 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 bon, donner certaines euh, légitimités aux personnes que nous n'avons pas choisies. Voilà, c'est ce que je voulais dire. Et euh, là, ils sont toujours, il y a toujours des crocs à jambes à chaque fois que nous cherchons euh, à, à avancer en réalité. Mais moi, je pense que euh, nous, les Africains, euh, c'est même la démarche que nous sommes en train de mener ici sur terrain, euh, d'être en contact avec, en contact direct avec d'autres jeunes euh, dans, euh, dans le sein du continent euh, africain. Et créer, nous devons créer des réseaux pour que euh, nous puissions nous en sortir. Et il n'y a pas seulement le pays africain, mais il y a aussi tant d'autres États dans le monde qui subissent le même, la même situation que nous. Et nous devons nous mettre ensemble pour sortir de cette situation. Je crois que c'est ce que j'ai à dire. Merci beaucoup, Jean-Marie. Uh, this is going to be the last words for, for all of you again. Jean-Marie Kalonji is an activist of the year for uh, Africans Rising. He is the director of La Quatrième Bois. Uh, please um, check the work of La Quatrième Bois and all of the movement in the Congo. Um, uh, Patricia, just a final word. Yes, I just wanted to thank everybody for just taking the time to, to learn more about what is happening in the Congo and how it's connected to us all. And as I'm reading some of the messages, uh, some of uh, the members are writing in regards to what Pan-Africanism means 
uh, Pan-Africanism is when we see what is happening in Ferguson and we see people in Ferguson learning about Patrice Lumumba. Uh, Pan-Africanism is when we see young Congolese going to South Africa or Ghana learning the stories of uh, Widi Mandela, learning the stories of Kwame Nkrumah coming from Ghanaians themselves. And I think this needs to continue. Uh, I encourage people to not just stop today and where we are and, and not only look at, um, you know, how can I help, but our allies, you know, what Adam did today, uh, it took somebody taking the time to do that research, to even educate some of us who we find ourselves feeling like sometimes we know everything, but we have a person who, who might just dig a little bit deeper in places that you might not be looking. The same thing with Esmeralda taking the time to, to listen and to also contribute coming from a place of wanting to help coming from a, an open heart. And I think it's very important that we look at our allies outside of Africa and find ways where we can learn from them and they can learn from us. And most importantly, to not just forget the whole aspect of Ubuntuism, uh, what makes the world what it is today, well, whether we look at climate change, you know, what, what, what's going on in the Congo affects what's going on in Europe. What goes on in Europe affects what's going on in the USA and America. And, and to, to remember that we are all one, whether you're black, whether you're white, uh, whether you're from Congo or from Ghana, that at the end of the day, we're fighting for generations to come and we're fighting for humanity and for a better world. And if we can all be grounded in that and remember that that's what makes us human, that's what makes us children of God for those that uh, go along that path. Um, I think that, that that'll be something that'll take this new generation to a place that we may have not seen in the past. Thank you. Patricia is the founder of Congo Love, um, a coordinator for Friends of the Congo. Check it out. Look at it. She is also from Africans Rising for Peace, Justice and Dignity. Uh, join the movement and uh, build the numbers uh, and, and, and join the initiative. Uh, Michael, your last word. Yes, thank you, Kumba. Yes, thank you. Uh, and thank you for inviting me to, to this uh, webinar and to the work you do with the, you're doing with the Rewrite History campaign, which I think is fantastic. And um, yes, I think building on what Patricia uh, just uh, said, the issue of reparations is at heart an ethical issue and it is uh, a, a call for ethical responsibility for writing what is essentially ethical wrongs mm -hmm. and for rectifying a situation of um, deep um, deep, deep injustice and uh, immorality. And so that is the, also, this is also the spirit in which we need to, to uh, right the wrongs and rectify the injustices is also from a place of ethics and ethical integrity. And so um, I would like to just uh, say that as a as a uh, closing closing remark. <laughs> so thank yes. you, thank you, Michael. Michael from the European uh, Network of People of African Descent, a researcher and advocate for human rights. Thank you for your presence here, um, Esmeralda. Your last word. Uh, thank you so much for inviting me. I I really feel deep in my heart that as a Belgian. As a member of the family, a uh, great grandniece of Leopold II, I have a duty to acknowledge the past and to, to confront the past to try to make a, a better future and, and heal all the wounds. I also strongly believe that there is a, a big crisis of the system, of the leadership in the world, and that it's up to the citizen, citizen of every country, to try to unite and, and really try to make a better society, a sustainable, healthy, and, uh, and forget all the difference of, uh, of race, of religion, of uh, everything that uh, separate us, and just remember all what unify us. As Patricia said, we are all, all the same on, on this earth, and we have to remember that. 
Thank you, Esmeralda de Belgique, uh, journalist, activist, writer, um, documentary maker, and a strong vo in the, voice in the um, environmental movement. Thank you also for joining us today. Adam, your last word. Adam, your last word. Oh, Jean-Marie, oh, you have to mute. Okay. okay. Um, well, here's my last word. In the last six months, the world has seen two great contagions. One is the contagion of the coronavirus. The second is the contagion of what happened when that George Floyd video spread across the world and the millions of people who were moved to action by seeing that. That is the kind of contagion that I take hope from that makes me think that a belief in justice, a love of justice is something which can truly spread across the world faster than a virus can. And we have to keep that spreading. Thank you so much, Adam journalist, historian, writer. Uh, thank you to all of the panelists. Thank you to those who have been following us on Facebook Live, those who have registered in the Zoom, people who put their question, their comment. The conversation were very lively in the chat. Um, just people talking and responding to each other. And this is why we're having this panel. The connection, please, please paste, change, exchange contact, uh, and let's keep the work going. Uh, as I said it earlier, uh, we are part of a tradition of resistance. Um, and um, those who are historians like Adam and, and Michael will tell you that at every time in history, even in the darkest, in the most difficult moment, there's been always people um, fighting to make the change happen so that we could be here. So we are, we are putting ourselves in that trajectory and building together a, a, different, a different world together. So thank you, thank you for taking the time, for joining us, for all the work that you're doing and inviting everyone uh, who joined us today to talk to someone around them, families, uh, colleagues, uh, neighbors, people you don't normally talk to, people you engage with in social media, people who don't believe what you're saying, who says, it's not true, it didn't happen that way. Let's engage them and let's force really the world to see the reality because uh, Michael talked about ethical and moral. The truth is that uh, I don't know many people, nations or corporation who will stand and say, I do bad. They all wanna look good. So we have to strip away the cover of pretending to do good by colonialism, you know, through development, through whatever they call it. Strip it away so that no one can stand next to it and be uh, covered by it. And they have to, to face it. Every time it changed, whether it's the apartheid system, colonial system, slavery, it changed when people could not anymore justify it, they couldn't look at themselves, and there were enough people to fight it together. So thank you, thank you again for all that you're doing, all the drop that you're making uh, to, to take us to a different place. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Jean-Marie, Patricia, Esmeralda, Michael. Adam, thank you, thank you to the translators, to the technician, to everybody that made it possible for us to be here today. Um, people who have been helping us with all the work that we are supposed to do, <laughs> caring for the kids. I know you heard somebody's voice somehow here in the end to distract me. Thank you to everybody who allowed us to be here and to do this work. Thank you and bye and see you soon. Make sure you vote. The recording has stopped.
Your spirit may fly away And your body may be broken Your lips they may not speak For some things cannot be spoken But time will not forget About the price you had to pay For the greed of men Who did not respect The woman The Congolese woman Oh, the woman They hurt your body and your mind And they take away your land They take away your jobs Put guns in your enemies' hands How many more must die Before the whole world pays For the telling of the lies The killings and the rape Of the woman The Congolese woman You dry your eyes and you Keep it going Pull yourself up with your own strong hand Strong and ever reaching for the sky That is a spirit may fly away and your body may be broken your lips they may not speak for some things cannot be spoken but time will not forget about the price you had to pay for the greed of men did not respect the woman or oh, the Congolese woman, the woman.